So when I was casting about for uh, poets that I have a great deal of love for, both their work and their person, uh, who are uh, GG winners, uh, Patrick and Lorna came immediately to mind. Uh, both Patrick Lane and Lorna Crozier have written many books in many genres. They have both won the Governor General's Award for Poetry and have been nominated two other times. <laughs> That's not bad. Um, I'd like to invite Patrick up to read first. Both of them were here a couple of years ago. Patrick with the collected poems, which he calls his doorstop volume. <laughs> this man can really write poems. I suggest you grab this and read every one. Uh, his work is, is um, subtle, challenging, delicate, and I'd say devastatingly frank. Please welcome Patrick Lane. I too will grab a glass of water. Thank you for inviting us uh, to Winnipeg. It's nice for Lauren and I both to be here. We were at a small dinner party last night and uh, we were we regaled and were regaled by stories of uh, the first year Lauren and I were together. We spent here in Winnipeg in the years since 1978 and 1979 when I was the writer in residence at uh, University of Man no yeah University of Manitoba, and Lorna was uh, writing her MA thesis, and we had both run away from our spouses. And it was a wild and fateful year. <laughs> and enough said about that. The stories last night are best not repeated. Um, <clears throat> anyway, it's nice to be back. I'm going to read a couple of poems from 40 years ago because I've been around a long time and I was just talking to Victor Enns very briefly uh, before and uh, he was talking about several friends who have been ill and I said most of mine are dead. So uh, many of the writers that I grew up with and who were my models and my peers and my companions and uh, the people who wrenched their lives and sacrificed many things into for the art of poetry are gone now. And, uh, and I treasure their memory and, uh, and, and wish they were here uh, to have been at an evening like we had last night just to tell some of the old stories. Anyway, um, I'm going to read these two poems, and I'll read four new poems from a new a volume which will be coming out next uh, this fall. Um, the new poems deal with uh, the fact that I have macular degeneration right now, so I already have fallen down getting down the stairs. So uh, I think Lorna is going to start sending me out with uh, people who will sort of handle me or something like that. <laughs> anyway, God, the see, this is a doorstop. The goddamn thing keeps. <laughs> Fuck, it's a lot of poetry. <laughs> this is a very a, a poem written about 40 years ago, a few, about five or six years before I first came to Winnipeg. <clears throat> Stigmata, which I, you know, of course, are the signs of, uh, of the wounds of uh, Jesus. Uh, enough said, they are also not just reserved only for him. Uh, many uh, saints uh, and in many cultures, stigmata play a great part. What if there wasn't a metaphor? And the bodies were only bodies, bones pushed out in awkward fingers. Waves come to the seawall, fall away. Children bounce mouths against the stones that man has carved to keep the sea at bay. And women walk with empty wombs, proclaiming freedom to the night. Through barroom windows, rotten with light, eyes of men open and close like fists. I bend beside a tidal pool and take a crab from the sea. His small green life twists helpless in my hand, the living bars of bone and flesh, a cage made by the animal I am. This thing, the beat, the beat of life, now captured in the darkness of my flesh, struggling with claws as if it could tear its way through my body, back to the sea. What do I know 
of the inexorable beauty, the unrelenting turning of the wheel I am inside me. Stigmata, I hold a web of blood. I dream of the scrimshod teeth of endless whales, the oceans it took to carve them. Drifting ships echo in fog the wounds of Leviathan, great gray voices giving cadence to their loss. The men are gone who scratched upon white bones their destiny. Who will speak of the albatross in the shroud of the man, the sailor who sinks forever in the Mindanao deep? I open my hand, the life leaps out. An early poem called Albino Pheasants, which were some pheasants that lived at the foot of a piece of land that I was living on, my, one of my youthful homes. And they were uh, albino birds. At the bottom of the field where thistles throw their seeds and poplars grow from cotton into trees in a single season, I stand among the weeds. Fence posts hold each other up with sagging wire. Here, no man walks except in wasted time. Machines rot on my margins. Men circle me with cattle, cars, and wheat. They say the land is wasted when it's wild, and they offer plows and apple trees to tame. But in the fall, when I've driven them away with their guns and dogs and dreams, I walk alone while those who'd kill lie sleeping in soft beds huddled against the bodies of their wives. I go with spear grass and hooked burrs and I wait upon the ice alone. Delicate, across the mesh of snow, I watch the pale birds come with beaks the color of discarded flesh, white. Their feathers are white, as if they had been born in caves and only now have risen to the earth to watch with pink and darting eyes the slowly moving shadows of the moon. There is no way to tell men what we do. The dance they make in sleep withholds its meaning from their dreams. That which has been nursed in bone rests easy upon frozen stone, and what is wild is lost behind closed eyes. Albino birds, pale sisters, succubi. Poems from a long time ago. Um, this is a recent poem called Assiniboine, which I'm reading tonight because, of course, you have the river. Um, and we were walking down by the rivers today. Got to be, gotta be careful I don't go too long here. <laughs> I'll just read two more poems. Assiniboine. Deep summer nights and you far off quiet in the dawn. That last morning the mute swans were on the river and I was unclean. I placed hot stones in water as you told me of the old people beside the slow current singing. If I look hard enough, I believe I can see the swans slide past on that long river going toward the lake. It took many stones, you weaving gross feathers in your hair and laughing. Do you remember the swans, the birds whose wings were song? Your mother told you they were ghost birds, but she was crazy, you said. And then the city, and you lost again in the bars, the empty rooms. It was the time when my life, when it was the time when one of my last lives was changing. I looked hard, but there was no finding you. I turned all the way around then and headed west toward the gray rain. It was a far away, that walking to the place where the sun drowns. Uh, 
limbo. Uh, for those of you who don't know, in the Catholic uh, consciousness, limbo is a place where uh, babies who are uh, unbaptized are buried. They're not allowed to be buried in, in sacred or sanctified ground. So they bury them outside the fences in the small towns of the prairie. And if you go to see the old, old towns where most everything is gone, you find the graveyard and you see the fences. And outside the graveyard, sometimes you'll see plastic flowers in the snow. The red truck by the barn rusts on its fenders. Ice crystals grew there like forgotten cities. The windshield, a broken star, where a face found itself shining. Close your eyes. There are only the old answers. The antelope calf lay curled in snow, her black hooves crossed, her head blunt as the axe my father used to break dry willow. There are hearts that give off heat days after they stop beating, a scuff of snow where she stumbled in the cold. The north held me long before it let me go. There are these fragments, the little graves outside the cemetery fence past Rosetown. They buried the babies beyond the wire in limbo, plastic flowers in the snow. There is a great fear in the world. Jesus, sweet Jesus, I know you're not coming back. My mother told me there are children so fragile they exist only as angels. I swear it upon her eyes, those dark knots of blue. Thank you. <laughs>